fans. In 1990, Earth First environmental leader Judy Barry had launched the Redwood Summer Campaign to fight the destruction of the Redwood Forest from her San Francisco Bay Area office. Her successes had repercussions. A logging truck rammed into her car in 1989, nearly killing Barry and her kids. Someone had also nailed this picture of Barry playing a violin on her door with rifle crosshairs over her and dog feces on it. Researchers stated that this was a known U.S. intelligence warning tactic. In 1990, a bomb went off under her car seat. She was paralyzed and died within another six years. The FBI first investigated Judy Barry and a passenger in Barry's car, Darrell Cherney, for planning to use a bomb themselves. After much protest, the FBI said they were looking for the perpetrator. Barry, known as Queen of the Quip, began to realize the FBI's corrupt attacks on protesters. At a news conference, she told the press, I hope the FBI find their man, and when they do, I hope they fire him. Barry and Earth First filed a lawsuit against FBI Area Chief Richard Held and key police leaders. The suit eventually gained enough powerful support that it forced Richard Held into an early retirement in 1993. In the years before Held's retirement, several key attacks occurred on Tupac Shakur as he broke into the music world, leading Tupac to say, I never had a record until I made a record. As Tupac's fame and wealth increased, promising more power and money behind his radical political agenda, the complexity of the attacks on him increased. First, Tupac landed a solo record deal for Tupacalypse Now that resulted in a worldwide MTV video release in October of 1991. Within several days, Oakland police stopped Tupac for jaywalking. As described in these official legal claim pages, police banged his head into a curb and choked him unconscious. News articles have reported at least two other cases where suspects have died in police hands from those same police actions. Tupac had already hired his New African People's Organization mentor, Watani Tayahimba, to work as his business manager. He hired NAPO National Chair Chokwe Lumumba to be his national legal consultant and to represent him on the police brutality case in which he won a large settlement from the government. This funding of a national radical black organization's leadership gave the FBI even more reason to target Tupac. Within a year, Tupac had a debut lead role in the major motion picture Juice, which had its premiere in San Francisco. That night, Tupac experienced a drive-by shooting on his and his friend's limousine as they traveled from the movie theater to the after party. The similar timing appears more than coincidental. More evidence of FBI Supervisor Richard Held's orchestration comes by way of witnesses catching plainclothes California police officers using an unmarked car to attempt a drive-by shooting of a police brutality witness in the 1990s. As Tupac's fame and fortunes rose, police attacks on the rap and film star increased. Tupac next starred in John Singleton's sophomore film, Poetic Justice, as the co-lead with Janet Jackson. Tupac's first CD, Tupacalypse Now, had gone gold, and his career was soaring. On August 22, 1992, the three-year anniversary of Huey Newton's assassination, the most complex attack on Tupac occurred. At the Marin Festival in the San Francisco Bay Area, Tupac came as an honorary guest. As Tupac signed autographs for kids, a man amongst a group of strangers ran up to Tupac and punched him for no reason. Tupac's road manager and Matula Shakur's son, Maurice Moprim Harding, blocked others in the group from attacking Tupac. Harding took a gun out and shot it straight towards the sky before he and Tupac took off running. Witnesses supported that at least one of the strangers fired his gun at Tupac, all in front of police, who failed to intervene or arrest the shooters. One of the bullets hit a boy nearby, but police only arrested Tupac and Harding, though they let them go with no charges when witnesses exonerated them. Three months later, Vice President Dan Quayle denounced Tupac's debut CD in a nationally reported speech. Tupac had finished his second CD, strictly for my N-I-G-G-A-Z, in 1992, but his record label, Interscope, failed to release it. 
Tupac used this variation on the N-word as an acronym for Never Ignorant Getting Goals Accomplished in an attempt to reverse its negativity. Time Warner had a 25% stake in Interscope Records, and after Tupacalypse Now went gold, Time Warner bought another 25% share, gaining a dominant voice in the company. They then refused to release Tupac's second CD for another year. As the largest media company in the world, both Time and Warner had a history of supporting Republican candidates and conservative causes. For example, Time Incorporated's Vice President Charles Douglas Jackson rotated back and forth as an architect for the CIA, heading their psychological warfare division for various presidents, and running Time Magazine's empire. British editor Francis Stoner Saunders, whose book The Cultural Cold War is seen here, went through C.D. Jackson's letters, which showed that he ran many of these operations through Time's magazines. These operations included targeting black musicians. This suggests that Time Warner refused to release Tupac's second CD because it made fun of President Bush and Vice President Quayle several times, and the presidential elections came up in November. Time Warner also censored many of Tupac's radical songs and videos for that CD. A year before, a court acquitted the white cops who were caught on video beating Rodney King. This acquittal sparked the L.A. riots in 1992. Fred Hampton Jr., the Chicago Black Panther leader's son, organized protests in Chicago. Hampton Jr. led the Illinois chapter of the socialist Uhuru group. Hampton said that one of the same police officers who targeted his father arrested him. He also said that people had made several attempts on his life, as his picture through his shattered car window exemplifies. Police also charged Hampton with arson. The judge said the building police charged Hampton for burning never actually had a fire. Despite that, Fred Hampton Jr. received many years in jail. When he was released, Fred Hampton formed the Prisoner of Conscience Committee a nationwide activist group. Events around the L.A. riots also led Tupac Shakur to change his persona. Former Black Panthers and other activists had garnered a gang peace truce between leading Bloods and Crips gang sects in Los Angeles. As seen in this 1994 Los Angeles Times headline, these peace truces started spreading. They eventually went nationwide, and these gangs started turning into community activists. For example, one Crip leader talked at a conference sponsored by a black socialist group called Panther in England. Also, the Latino version of the Black Panthers, the Young Lords, influenced New York's largest gang, the Latin Kings, to participate in this movement. The video, Black and Gold, and the Columbia University Press published book, The Almighty Latin King and Queen Nation, detailed their activist conversion in the mid-1990s. Not long after the early 1990s Blood Crips peace truce, Tupac and one of his mentors had come up with a political plan. Tupac decided to take on a gangster rap persona in order to appeal to gangs and then politicize them. He did this as part of the peace truce movement, participating in a Blood Crips peace truce picnic and other events. Tupac called this the Thug Life Plan. He and his still-imprisoned stepfather, Matulu Shakur, wrote up a code of Thug Life, reprinted in Jamal Joseph's book, Tupac Legacy. Joseph, formerly part of the Panther 21, later became director of Columbia University's film program. Joseph was also part of Tupac's extended family of ex-Panther mentors. The Code of Thug Life tried to lessen the harm gangs did to their communities. Matulu eventually brokered a peace truce between the Blood and Crips gangs in the nationwide federal prison system. Tupac's Thug Life plan also attempted to politicize more rappers. Trying to spread the wealth, he formed a temporary rap group called Thug Life that put out a CD in 1994. Matulu's son, Maurice Moprim Harding, rapped in the Thug Life group. Police retaliated against the gang peace truce movement and Tupac, eventually with some of the same officers. They appeared to start using the same harassment arrest strategy against Tupac that they used against his mother's Black Panthers. Police arrested Tupac for many charges that were dismissed, such as saying he was smoking marijuana in public in a hotel lobby at an Atlanta National Political Rap Convention that had scheduled him to speak. At the next year's Atlanta Rap Convention, 
They charged him with slapping a woman who asked for his autograph when witnesses said that the woman had actually started a fight.